Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Pop Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly, and that includes me, which, sure. So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, videos, and written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today I'm beyond honored to be speaking with Jasmine Vine. Hi, Jasmine. Hello. So Jasmine is just, there's just this long laundry list of everything you've done. You are a podcaster, certified master practitioner of NLP, timeline therapy, and hypnotherapy, all of which rolls up to the title you take as trans empowerment specialist. And of course, I always love transgender people helping the transgender community, and that's why I wanted to talk to you. How are you doing today? Doing awesome. I'm excited. There Very you go. Excited to chat. I hope so. I, I want to start. Your entire story is completely fascinating, and I got to. You were bullied as a child. You suffered mental health issues after, even after beginning transition. So after this, this, all of this difficult um, beginning, what gave you the inspiration to, to document in video your entire transition? Oh, the first video I put out on YouTube, I did it with no expectations. I was kind of like, oh, this is just a fun thing to fun thing to do and then it really blew up as in right. like got 800,000 views on it before I had to take it down because I was switching channels and then when I put oh. it back up it blew up again over a million views over five million I think so I was kind of encouraged by that and seeing people posting their comments in there saying how much that I'd helped them and I was like what it's just like a video of just me being myself has helped these people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what really encouraged me to continue putting videos out there and to, you know, um, show people the hormone journey and what um, was happening at different months and the updates and all of that. It was really those positive comments from people um, who had their minds opened by it that encouraged me to keep going. I see. You, you mentioned, I mean, even 5 million views even. Was was that yeah. something that you were like, oh, sure, this will be, I mean, were you prepared for that? I mean, that's a very immediate <laughs> jettisoned into fame. I mean, mm. what went I through your mind? I was not prepared for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was very interesting because with that came a lot of hate comments. And, you know, yeah. I was 14 years old. Right. I hadn't really experienced that um, outside of, you know, bullying at school. So to have that many people commenting on me um, all at that time was, yeah, it was a little bit shocking. <laughs> I had, um, you know, like news uh, people reaching out to me wanting to cover my story and everything. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Um so, yes, I was certainly not prepared for that. But you know what? It was a good entry into social media, that's for sure. <laughs> it was certainly trial by fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you have regrets about that now? I mean, would you do it differently if it happened again? No. No. Really? I don't... Um... I tend to not hold regrets about the past because there's nothing that can be changed about it. So I prefer my focus to be on what I have influence over now and in the future. Um, and, you know, it is what it is. I've learned what I've learned. Um, I wouldn't call this a regret, but 
it's certainly as a result of that video going as viral as it did initially, anything that I've put out since then has not performed to that standard. And so oh. there's been this situation of like, oh, my gosh, I started out so strong <laughs> with it. And so now anything under that is like, come on, social media, do the thing. Sure. But but now you're on this podcast and that should certainly <laughs> blow you right back up again, right? <laughs> right. Thank goodness. Well, what do you think? What do you think? Was the world just primed for a young transgender story? Because you, you said 14. You were 14 when you pu yeah. uh, published the first video, yeah. right? Yeah. It was a time where particularly people who identified as guys who were like makeup artists and things like that, they were really blowing up on YouTube at the time. And when I posted that first video, it wasn't as a trans woman. I didn't know that I was trans at the time. I, I related to a lot of these people that I saw on YouTube. And when I posted it, I called it 14-year-old um, male to female transformation video. <laughs> That's what I called it. And I think at the time that was something that was really blowing up. So it kind of just hit at the right time. <laughs> right. So so at the time you weren't aware or you didn't, you weren't identifying as transgender? No, no. Huh. It was a slow, uh, a slow realization for me. <laughs> okay. Because growing up, I, like my family wasn't really discouraging of my femininity because I'd always been very feminine. I'd always, you know, I, as you're wearing the Sailor Moon top right now, one of the first things I think of is like watching Sailor Moon as a kid and like imagining I've got these long nails and long hair and, you know, right. transformations. Mm -hmm. And my parents would see that and go, oh, that's just a kid having fun. It was never judged. It was never, you know, boys shouldn't do that. Like that wasn't a thing with them. That's good. And that alongside what I exposed myself with on YouTube and all of that, I got to a point where I was like, boys can wear girly clothes. Boys can wear makeup. Boys can have long hair. Um, and it, it literally got to the point where I was like, guys can be on hormone replacement therapy. <laughs> Fair um, enough. So it, it just went through that to the point that I was starting to be gendered correctly. Um, by people first from, you know, behind and people would mistake me as a, as a woman and go, Oh, that feels nice. Right. And it wasn't a situation of, um, guys could want to be women. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to that point, but um, sure. yeah, it was pretty far along to the point that I was essentially presenting as myself um, half the time before I realized, oh, I guess this means I'm trans. I see. How old were you? How long did that take? I mean, was it years? No, it did happen pretty quickly. It would have been like by the time I was 16, I was living full time okay. as myself. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So... Before that, it was like I started presenting as myself on the weekends or um, outside of school, wherever I would go, I'd present as myself. And then it just kept becoming more and more. And then, you know, when I was 15, I, I was starting to identify. I didn't know exactly where I sat, but I knew I was a lot more feminine. And so even going to school, I was wearing like, these circle lenses and makeup and my hair was growing out and I, you know, came across as a lot more gender non-conforming. So yeah, it was kind of a transition of like boy to very feminine guy to, <laughs> to woman in the span of like a year and a half probably. Actually it doesn't sound all that atypical as far as gender transition goes, but do you, um, it's interesting. So you had mentioned hormone therapy though. Yeah. Do you, were, you were able to begin hormone therapy, uh, earlier than 18? Yes. I okay. Was. Are we, are we not allowed to talk about this? Is this a... 
black it market wasn't hormone legal. therapy. So, okay. It wasn't legal. Yes. Just asking. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not something that I would recommend for anyone, but at the time I had been seeing a gender psychologist um, for a little while and the laws where I was um, was basically that we'd need to go to family court to get puberty blockers prior to 18. I see, yeah. And it basically wasn't an option. Like growing up as poor as I did, we did not have the money to go through the court system. For that. And so I was kind of given that as the only option. It was like, you're going to have to just wait until you're 18 and then get onto HRT. And that to me was just unacceptable. It was, the dysphoria was really, really spiking at that time because I'm growing Mm -hmm. more and more facial hair and I'm getting taller and I'm growing, you know, all of that's happening. So I was in the midst of that, um, you know, testosterone really starting to affect me a lot more. Um, Obviously, you know, voice dropped and all of that happened. And I was like, it felt like they were saying, okay, you're going to have to just grow into a man before you do what you know that you need to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Which incidentally is very upsetting. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's the same experience that that we're seeing in certain states here now in the United Mm. States where they just go, well, you're not allowed to get any kind of transgender care until you're an adult. And then by then you're like, well, now I have so much to undo. Yeah. So so I I understand the the difficulty. Of course, when I was a kid and this was back in the late Jurassic era, actually, if you Ah. had like a little like a tyrannosaurus rex i would walk to school as my little pet um i didn't even realize those kinds of things existed and they did i mean w path yeah. you know put out the its first standard of care in 1979 and i would have been nine years old at that time yeah. but uh it's certainly not something that like i even thought would ever be the case and so yeah. I, I mean i gotta tell you if i had been you know, nine years old or even 14 and seen your video, I think it would have done the same Mm. for me. I would have gone, oh my gosh, this opens my eyes to so many possibilities. And that being said, I have the feeling my family would have been like, no. Mm. I said, listen, I'd like to do this. No, sorry, not going to happen. But that's, uh, that's an exceptional story. I have a question, and if it's too sensitive, you know, please tell me. There's you really any that are too sensitive. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Then I have a set of others. Hang on a second. I'll pull them out. Ah, let me get um, my mind around. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hard questions for Jasmine. I've got a chapter yep. here in my... <laughs> so you did you now you you've struggled with mental health and you've been very open yeah. about your struggles with mental health. When ultimately, I believe you were 17 the first time you you entered a a hospital, right? To the psych ward, yeah. Okay. I'm trying to be nice about it. I use the same terminology because it's much more shocking to say, oh, yeah, no, I've been in the psych ward like four times. Yeah, Fifth (laughs) time they sent me home. But, um, oh, what was the question? Oh, right. So you were 17 years old. You had started hormone therapy by then you had had a million to five million views on a video catapulted into into fame the news people were coming after you Mm -hmm. did all of this contribute oh to what specifically the mental health yeah yeah it definitely did um it was a double-edged sword because earliest I can remember I've always wanted to be in a situation where I'm helping people sure. and that's always been a primary driving factor for me and so it was very freaking awesome to be in that situation where so many people are feeling helped by the content I'm putting out there sure um that was brilliant absolutely loved it but with that there was a lot of very nasty stuff as well like even, um, 
you know, I shared about my dad passing when I was 11 and all this swath of comments come in saying, oh, your dad must have killed himself because he was ashamed of you. I'm like, whoa. Wow, yeah. <laughs> they didn't hold back. Like the, you know, the comments were very, very mean. And at the time that definitely did affect me. Like I was in the doom scrolling kind of situation. I'm going through all these comments and I'm arguing with people and going, no, look oh, at this sure. article and oh, there's a blah, blah, blah. And, you know, back then I didn't understand that there was a difference between arguing with trolls versus <laughs> educating open people. <laughs> yes. Very true. Mm. <laughs> yes. So that's what I spent a lot of my time doing. And that was very taxing on my mental health because I was talking sure. to people that were not interested in hearing another perspective. No. no. <laughs> Which, in my naivety, I was um, you know, thinking that was a great thing to do, but not so much for my mental health. That's ultimately what led me to leaving social media for a few years. Sure. Um, yeah, putting my mental health first and deciding that I was basically going to go into stealth and I did for a good three years there and I didn't post at all. Um, and that is a lot to do with those hate comments, a lot to do with how that did affect me because I got to a point where I was like, okay, I know that I'm helping these people, but all of this is making this suicidality much worse. So I kind of got to a point where I was like, I'm either not going to be here, therefore not able to help anyone, right. or I'm going to really stay in this space and potentially burn myself out and have a pretty negative consequence for that. And so I decided to step back, which I don't regret. That was something that I needed to do at the time. And over time I've built a thicker skin and I'm – <laughs> not very easily swayed by hate comments anymore. They don't bother me at all. And so now that balance is much better. I'm like, hey, comments, it's like water off a duck's back. Don't care at all. So I focus on the positivity and I focus on the people that I'm helping. And that fuels me and the other things just are irrelevant. <laughs> it's a good perspective. Do you, is it just a thicker skin or was it? stability in who you are did did you yes let me okay <laughs> all yes right to both of those because and i and let me because let me ask it slightly differently because i'm curious you know the two obviously are related but i mean there's an ability to ignore haters but there's also the ability to see that what haters are saying is not even applicable to you, you know, yes. when, when you believe what you're doing is, has, has been helpful, not only for you, but for millions of other people, hate comments are, are irrelevant, really, you know, it's a minority. So. Oh, I've got so much to say on this. <laughs> I know you do. That's why I asked the question, but <laughs> yeah. give me a short, a, sm a, a small bit of it right at first, because I have another part before we move on to something else. I mean, is it, go ahead. Hate comments can only affect you if there is a button to press. There needs to be a button that someone can press on for it to affect you. If that button isn't there, they can't press it. It can't affect you. So hate comments become like nowadays, if someone says, oh, you'll always be a man, I'm like, you might as well be calling me a blue elephant. I'm like, it's so irrelevant. Sure. <laughs> like, okay, sure. But part of this as well is understanding, um, a coach of mine uses this metaphor about the difference between salt and chili. So if you have a certain wound and say you're like, you've got a wound on your arm, if you were to put salt on that, it is going to sting. It's going to hurt sure. a lot, right? Same as if you put chili on it. It's probably going to freaking hurt. If that wound is not there or it's completely healed and you put salt on it, you're probably just going to get a nice exfoliation. Like it's <laughs> it's not going to hurt you. Sure. Because the wound isn't open and active. And it's the same right. thing emotionally. Right. If you have an emotional wound 
or there's a certain part of you that believes your identity isn't valid or you're not trans enough or you're not this enough or that enough and then someone throws that hate comment at you and it's that salt it's going to affect you it's right. going to hurt it's there. going to be really painful yeah. If that is completely healed and you know your worth, you know who you are and you're completely valid in who you are and you understand yourself, you're going to be like, oh, thanks for that exfoliation. That's nice. Moving on. <laughs> right. <laughs> Usually people pay for these salt rubs, but I got one for free. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You answered my question perfect. Th thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. You also used two magic words, trans enough. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a, it's a, it's such a, it's interesting to me how mm -hmm. that's the first thing we do. We go, Hey, I think I'm transgender, but am I transgender enough? Oh, yeah. Then you have to ask everybody around you, you know, do I seem mm -hmm. like a girl to you? And then if they go, you go, damn it. All right. I knew it. And then you go, <laughs> you know, you throw away all your clothing and you know, it's, it's strange. But I bring this up, so it looked like you have something to say. Did Did you want to follow up on that? Oh no! The only thing I'm thinking is I um I left a little bit of a hook back there because I talk, spoke about the salt, but not the chili. <laughs> did you want to finish the chili? I don't. Because because if you have no wound there and you get chili on you, it could be, maybe it could irritate you. I guess I don't know, but yes. So it's it's really like a metaphor for boundaries. So the salt is an indication that there is something within yourself that needs to be healed because the salt will not affect you if there's not something that needs to be healed within yourself. I see. The chili, on the other hand, is probably still going to affect you. So that's the difference between something that is an internal thing to look into and to heal versus something that is actually unacceptable behaviour and needs to have a boundary in place. I see. So if someone is behaving violently or, you know, they have close proximity to you and there's a threat to your health or your safety, that is chilly. That needs to be stopped and, you know, that's a totally different situation. So I, I do think that's important to mention because there is things that will only hurt us if there's something within ourselves that is already hurt versus things that are going to be hurtful regardless. And hate comments is an interesting one because I think it kind of falls into both categories depending on what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask, yeah. how do you distinguish between the two? Yeah, yeah. That is a very tricky one because the chili can still be an indicator that there's something within you to heal. It can still be sure. an indicator to look deeper into, you know, things within yourself. Right. And it can be unacceptable behavior that should not happen. <laughs> So it can kind of be both. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is there an obvious decision tree to figure out which it is? Or it's just, it's ultimately mm. looking inside, I guess. And well, I suppose yeah. using the metaphor, if you can heal the wound, at the very least, you're going to know if it still hurts, that it must be an external bit of hate because you've you've yeah. taken away the button as you said you the the button's yeah. not there to press mm. it's a good metaphor i look at it on an emotional and a mental level so emotionally if a hate comment comes to you and it makes you feel super emotional something comes up say like, oh you'll never be a woman I'm like okay cool ouch that hurt let's just <laughs> pretend that that hurt sure. go, oh where have i felt this before and then immediately you can link that emotion to that event to something in your past, most likely. Oh, when I was playing dress up with my cousins, my mum came in and said, oh, you're not a girl, put this stuff away. Sure. You know, if you can link it back to something like that in your childhood where there's unprocessed emotions or there's resentment or there's, you know, fear or anger or sadness or whatever, that is an indication like, okay, if I resolve that, then this thing, someone saying you'll never be a woman, isn't going to hurt as much because it's not linked to this. Sure. On the other hand, if we're looking at it from a mental perspective, that's looking at our beliefs and our thought patterns and whatnot. So someone says, you'll never be a woman. What do you actually believe about yourself? If that is hurtful to you and it's not hurtful on an emotional level, 
but it could be hurtful on a mental level, then that's an indicator that, okay, perhaps on some level, I don't believe that I'm a woman enough or that I'm, you know, good enough to blend into society or whatever the case may be. And so again, that's an indicator that, okay, there's a belief within me that is allowing that to hurt me. If both of those are resolved, that thought is just a thought. You're like, okay, cool. (laughs) Moving on. It's not hurtful anymore. Now, for me, there's a difference in proximity. If someone is in my physical proximity and they're saying that, that is much more of a threat than someone online. Certainly. Yes. So that's um, a factor in it as well is online itself doesn't bother me at all. I can ignore that. I will never hear from that person ever again. If I find out they live five minutes from my house and they stalk me at the shops, that's a different situation. Very different, yeah. (laughs) Now it's chilly. (laughs) Got it. Yeah. I was actually – I was – leaning toward really the that last thinking that um it really depends on on proximity because i mean when you when you mention a root memory or even a uh yeah. like a like a, a a root belief you know some some of those are very difficult to find i mean that's why we have things like emdr and and uh yeah. hypnotherapy even you know mm. To, to attempt to process those things because we may have yeah. pushed it from conscious acknowledgement. I don't want to say memory. Yeah. We've pur- purchased it, pushed it from conscious acknowledgement. So mm. I don't know, difficult, uh, still difficult. Those that the processing yeah. steps tough. Um, this leads into mm. a, a question I'd like to ask if that's okay. I don't want to move yeah. on before you're ready. Oh, good. There, so I, I alluded to, you know, 1979, I was nine years old. When you mentioned Sailor yeah. Moon, by the way, that you were watching the Sailor Moon um, um, shows, I thought, oh, I did the same, only it was Linda Carter and Wonder Woman. And, you know, I thought oh. I'm not going to say that because if I say that, people are going to go, God damn, she's old. I didn't know she was <laughs> that old. Jesus. It's the same situation. It's it's the transformation like, oh. (laughs) Yes. I always, I would, I would do that when nobody was around. Certainly. Like, I'm not going to do this like in the, you know, middle of a, of a, of a like school or something, but I would do the, the spin around like, like uh, Linda Carter would do. I'm typically falling over because I didn't have really good balance, (laughs) which incidentally, Got better. I started uh, hormone therapy, and for some reason, my balance mm. got better. And oh, and I, th- I know it's weird. I think it was actually because I started doing something that showed I valued myself, and mm. and then I was then I was more aware of. I had more situational awareness. I got a lot oh, of thought nice. around that, but I want to move into the actual question mm. because I started this whole process. Sorry, I kicked something down there and I'm like, what the hell was that? <laughs> I started this whole process when I was 52. And I never, I personally never experienced guilt or shame yeah. for my gender. I just assumed it was who I was and other people had something wrong with them. And, mm. or just, you know, a lack of understanding. Let me say it like that. So when you started at 14, or I guess, you know, hormone therapy at maybe 16, it seems like there would be less shame and there might be less risk, a sense of less risk than Mm -hmm. if you're in your 40s or your 50s or your 60s. Obviously, you can't speak for anybody other than yourself. How would you how would you respond to that? Mm -hmm. There, the further you go along in life, the more you establish, the more and more that risk builds up. So the younger you transition, the less risk there is. Absolutely. Um, because you haven't built a life yet. You're not in a career path. You don't have a family. You haven't had kids. Sure. You don't like 
that whole situation, all of that adds another layer of risk to it. Am I going to be, you know, sacked from this job? Am I going to lose my wife? Am I going to, are my kids going to hate me? Like all of those types of things, massive risk. And especially for, um, you know, those assigned male at birth and, you know, transitioning later on in life, often they will benefit from the way society is set up in the sense that they'll have higher incomes. Of course. Things like that. Yeah. And so that adds another layer of risk again. It's like, oh, we were talking about this just before we um, <laughs> we started recording, but that whole um, misogyny and, like, prejudice that comes up afterwards that we can experience both ends of it um that is a massive risk for some people because if they're really established in their career and they're um you know a professional and they've done a certain thing for many years and then suddenly people start mansplaining things to them (laughs) sure yeah Yeah. I, i mean i mean i get that having gone from like executive uh-huh. management to, you know, some schmo at the at, at the grocery store saying, well, let me tell you how this macaroni and cheese things work. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I, I, th- I think I got it. I th- just give me the box. I think I got yeah. it. But yeah, so so risk, certainly and and entrenched privilege. Uh, completely agree. Oh, yeah. What about guilt and shame, though? Oh, did did you have any guilt and shame before you transitioned? Oh, that I have to really dig for that. Was there guilt Good. and shame around my transition? I don't think there actually was. There was a certain amount with like the bullying side of things, mm-hmm. but that didn't matter to me as much as the family side. And there was never any guilt or shame around my identity from them, um, as horrible as they were in a lot of um, different areas. <laughs> yeah, in every other story, <laughs> they were okay in one yeah. regard. That's good. Yeah, that was one where it was not ever shamed. So I don't feel I did have a lot of that. It was more so after transitioning and not fully accepting myself and say like in the dating world, for example, there would be a lot of shame that would come up in that situation. So I think it's, it's situation based as well. Um, where like comparison starts creeping in and like, Oh, is this person, you know, attracted to me as a person or are they a chaser or are they blah, 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 blah. Right. Right. Yeah. So there would be some certain bits of shame that would come up in that. And I spoke about this on a recent podcast episode about like my dating experiences. Um, And I spoke about a few situations where I had put myself in dangerous situations in dating. And there was definitely some guilt and shame that I had to work through in relation to those experiences. Yeah. They were some things that I put myself in those situations because of my lack of acceptance of myself Mm -hmm. and looking back I'm like oh okay that's that's a choice Jasmine (laughs) cool and I did have to process some shame and guilt around that but other than that I wouldn't say so okay I'm like here's all these situations of guilt and shame but other than that none but other than that really none (laughs) Perfect. I'm going to take a a little, like a tiny bit of a side road, but I'm going to come back to this road because I, I want to, because it's a, there, there's something I'm really dying to hear about. Um, Hmm. You, so you've struggled with mental health and, and it's funny, you know, anytime I mention to somebody, presumably you get the same, you go, yeah, I've had mental health problems. Almost invariably somebody goes, Really? Somebody in the LGBTQ mm. community who had mental health difficulties, huh? Ah. Yeah, I know. It's not an easy life. Do you feel, however, because I have an opinion on this that, that maybe I'll tell you after. Mm. Let me actually ask the question. 
do you feel that the struggle that you had to face with mental health is a benefit or a detriment now when you when you go to help other people? Oh, benefit massively. Why is Absolutely that? benefit. Because without those experiences, I would I could potentially read from a textbook. I could say, oh, these are the things that people experience with this kind of thing, and I, I could, you know, sure. possibly still help them absolutely. But without that personal experience piece, I wouldn't be able to connect with them on that deeper level. So right. that to me is invaluable. And when I was in my um, suicide crisis counselling role, there was a particular situation where a um, trans woman at, was on the other line with me. It's a suicide crisis line, so obviously she was not in a good situation. Sure. She was explaining her situation and what was going on and me listening. I was like, you are explaining my, like, me a couple of years ago. But like, sure. I relate to this so deeply. But typically in um, those types of roles, there's a massive expectation that you don't share anything about your own personal experience. Right. And so, you know, I'm listening and I'm affirming, I'm reflecting back, feeling and all, like, all these things. And we got to a certain point in the call where she was like, you know what, you probably don't understand it all and hung up. And it was absolutely freaking gut-wrenching. And it's one I of bet. those core things that I think about when I, that was when I remembered how important it was for me to share my story and mm. to share what I was experiencing. And that's what caused you to come, <laughs> come out, I was going to say, but it's what yeah. caused you to return to the, to the public eye, ah, you're saying? Absolutely. It did. Oh gosh. Oh my gosh. What a good story. Do you... Go ahead. Do, do you think... Oh, it's just massive. There are many people who go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist mm -hmm. even expecting to be able to work through some of the issues that we do. That I'm, yeah. I'm Sorry, when I say people, I mean, I mean transgender community. Yeah. Expect to be able to work through this with a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Yeah. Do you feel that's something possible or no? Yes, it depends what the person is wanting from that situation. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the clients that I work with, both in the mental health space and in the voice space, they come to me because they've had experiences where they've seen other people and they haven't felt sure. understood or they've felt that there's, you know, something missing. Like in the voice space, for example, there's so many people that come to me and say, oh, I was seeing this speech pathologist and she was really good. And, you know, she seemed really nice and everything, but there was just this lack of understanding around certain things. And so I had to constantly explain myself and describe things. And so talking with someone who has lived experience as a trans person eliminates all of that. You can come into the situation and go, okay, I'm here to work through this thing. And all of that background information is sure unnecessary. We don't need to go into sure. it. Or the most someone will go into it, so they're like, oh, yeah, I had, you know, this experience with my dad and he said blah, 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 and I'm like, oh, yeah, totally understand <laughs> because I do because I've, I've seen it so many times and I've experienced sure. it myself. Sure. And so there's kind of this um, camaraderie or this this nod between trans people where we're like, you get certainly. it. Yeah, certainly. And I think that's very valuable. Like that to me is a very valuable thing and, you know, a lot of the reason I do the mindset work that I do is because I want trans people, like more trans people, to be in a mental health space where they're able to sure. step up and help other people. Sure, sure. Because the more trans people we have, the other trans people who are like in the pit and really struggling can connect with, I honestly think that would make such a massive difference to have that support for trans people by trans people. I, I don't know if I exactly I answered the question. I went on you a bit did. of a tirade there. No, 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 <laughs> no, it was perfect. And because there are, there are thoughts I want to express, but what I'd rather do is tell you that I'm, I'm coming back to the earlier point. That was our side yeah. road. Because now what you do is 
help other people. And, yeah. and I would take the guess. Part of the reason why I wanted to ask you about guilt and shame is that I would guess when you're trying to empower transgender people, the mm -hmm. first, the, the primary barrier you reach is a, is a sense of guilt and shame. I'm not allowed yeah. to do this. I shouldn't be allowed to do this. Yeah. Can you, can you talk about that at all? What you do to address it? Oh, that is a journey. <laughs> that one, because it depends on the person's upbringing. It depends on, you know, what they have experienced previously. Because like for me, speaking from my experience, there wasn't much guilt or shame around the trans identity. Right. It right. wasn't as much of an issue. But for and, people and who I would say someone I, who grows up, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I would get, because when I've had conversations with people who do have a lot of guilt and shame around that, yeah. I've had some difficulty relating, which is why I wanted to take that sort of circuitous right. route to say, have you had guilt and shame? Do you feel experience is necessary? Now that you're helping people primarily focused on, or, or primarily uh, barred from, from pro progress. So... So I'm trying, I'm asking you because I go I like when people have said oh, I feel a lot of guilt and shame I go oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> oh my god! And like I don't I'm like I don't have a good answer. I just go yeah I just cut it out. Yeah. But that, but that's why I ask the question. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry I interrupted you. F finish up what what uh, what you were gonna say. Oh gosh I've got no idea what that thought train was. Let me think. Uh, um, glad I interrupted. Sorry. <laughs> No, when, oh yeah, that's, so when people are going on the journey to healing from that guilt and shame, the environment is a very important aspect of that. Mm. A lot of people try to yeah. heal that while they're in a situation that is consistently adding on to it. Yes, right. So if they're like in a relationship with someone that doesn't accept them and, is constantly going, oh, but no, I want the old you, like the person that that right. I fell in love with, blah, blah, blah. That is a very difficult environment to drop guilt and shame in. Yeah. <laughs> so often it is a slow road where people are slowly coming to terms with what their gender might be and what they want their expression to be and how they want to show up in the world and, you know, all of those initial exploratory things. And then over time, it's looking at what has contributed to that guilt and shame in the past. Has it been bullying? Has it been a evangelical Christian family? Or has it been like, you know, where has those experiences come from? Or where have those feelings come from? And then what in my current environment is contributing to that? What is feeding it? Sure, sure. Because you need to deal with both. We need to go back and heal the things from the past that are contributing to that, but then also look at the present and look at how you're um, changing your future to make that less of a trigger. Mm -hmm. And that's why one of the biggest things for most trans people early in their transition is to find accepting community and to connect sure. with other trans people and people that see them as themselves and all of that. That's right. a crucial step in the process. So, yes, environment, what's happened in the past, need to address both of them because otherwise there's going to be something that's fighting against you from letting it go. Right, right. And and that supportive environment is, is one of the first things that helps you say, yes, I am trans enough. Yeah. So so just to go back to you thought I wasn't going to end up make that, making that U-turn, but I did <laughs> finally get there. We were on one big roundabout and... <clears throat> Or in Australia, we would call Chuck a Yui, but anyway. Yeah, that's what we say. It's, it's a what? Chuck a Yui? Um, take a U turn there and say, oh, oh. Chuck a Yui at that next street. All right, perfect. <laughs> perfect. I'm going to start using that so that people go, the hell are you from? And I'll go, yeah. I'm from Los Angeles. Why? <laughs> and they'll go, I don't think that's an LA thing. Be but I don't care. <laughs> Right. But it'd be fine. It'd be fine. When when I lived in the deep south in, in the in the United States, people would go, Well, you're yeah. clearly not southern. And I would say, 
I am too Southern. I'm from Southern California. And they would go, <laughs> hmm, not quite the same. Yeah. It's funny. I'm telling you a joke. You Have you been to the United States? No, I have not. Yeah, it's always good when you tell somebody a joke and they go, I got no context. Like, well done. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, I know. I know <laughs> the disparities with the deep south versus the California. I, sure, sure. I work with enough people from the States to not understand that. Right, <laughs> right okay. For the most part, so, though, it's usually relevant to, um, we call it the West Coast privilege for people tr like feminizing their voice. Mm. Because anyone on like the upper West Coast of the US has a much easier time feminizing their voice, particularly really? with accents and um, the consistency of resonance that they're able to hold just because of, yeah, it, it, it's a thing. There's a West Coast privilege. So we I do have a talk. bit of a joke about that in fem voice skills. <laughs> Interesting. I want to talk to you more about that, but maybe not right this second. But <laughs> be, because there, I have actually spoken to, gosh, I don't even know. What is it? Three, I think three speech language pathologists mm. like on this show. And I, and I'm, you know, I, I ask, I love asking this question. I, I don't know that I asked it of the yeah. third, but do you have a, do you have an opinion on whether a transgender vocal coach would be better than a cisgender vocal coach? I mean, my opinion is pretty strong that yes, a transgender vocal <laughs> well, coach course. would be better. <laughs> what a stupid question I'm asking you. But... Trans people by trans people. Sure, but, sure. Um, again, it's that understanding. And for me, it's... Um, Again, it's not having to describe anything. I can drop my voice down and I can explain, like, what does it sound like when I lift the resonance? And then what right. does it sound like when I make the pitch higher with that kind of sound? Then what does it sound like when I make it lighter, make it lighter, make it lighter, make it lighter? So I can demonstrate all of those things and show people where they're at, where they want mm -hmm. to get to. Um, cis women vocal coaches can't really do that, a speech pathologist. So true with pitch, certainly. Well, and, and, mm. and with resonance as well. The, yeah. Or not to the extent of it because well, of the effects of testosterone right. on Certainly. a trans person's vocal cords and, you know, our vocal uh, tract and all of that. Agreed. We have a wider range to be able to demonstrate things. So the, the that usually still... makes people feel very comfortable. <laughs> Oh, certainly. There is though, like I'm watching you. You you have your you're doing this with your hands, and you you moved some hair out of the <laughs> way. And right, mm, hang on, no, hang on, because there's a point. Is now with the way you're smiling, you know, there are, mm. and you're not quite looking head on, right? I mean, you know, there are cues, feminine cues that are very subtle. Mm. That I think. Like, that I watched for 52 years for what it's worth because, yeah. you know, when I was in graduate school, I really threw myself into, um, at the time, I guess, just dressing up. And then I looked into yeah. transition in 2001. But my point being that my cisgender voice coach mm. was able to, to demonstrate that was able to, mm. to mirror that back. And mm. I think there are, there are subtle cues that I don't know. There are subtle cues that I think y you really need observation to do. Now that doesn't mean you need a voice coach to pick up these cues. Cause you can go out to just, you know, the mall and go, mm. look at those people. I'm watching them talk or watch a movie. It doesn't make a difference. But yeah. so, so it's an interesting, you can demonstrate pitch and resonance more deeply than my cisgender voice coach could have mm. and she had more years of of uh i mean because then again you also transitioned very early on so mm. you know i think i've gotten to a point where I, I'm, i've run out of things to say so i maybe i'll just go mm, what do you think <laughs> oh gosh i don't know <laughs> right um, <laughs> hmm. i mean you got me thinking about something kind of interesting is that when a person grows up and they're socialized as a woman or, you know, as a girl, as a woman from the get go, yeah, 
there are certain cues that they will express that a trans woman would be able to learn from more so than from most other trans people. Which is kind of interesting. I think so. I think so. Mm. I think yeah. so. I grew up with three sisters. And my father was pretty absent. I think it was kind of close to almost being socialized in a, you know, mm. as a girl. I just assumed I was. So I don't, I mean, and that doesn't mean that I can, <laughs> that I can do what you just said. I will say that, you know, I've, there are cues that I know mm. sometimes I'll see, I'll watch, you know, it could be beautiful transgender person, wonderful voice. And then the way that that person's looking at you, I just kind of go, Ooh, mm. are you, is this, maybe this isn't a cisgender woman because it's, it's a different cue. So anyway, just a. Yeah. Random thought. Mm. I don't know how we got to that, but it's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, have, I have one final question that I that I, I wanna I wanna ask. Because now you do you do all this coaching. I don't know how many people you've you've coached. I, I believe hundreds, I think I've heard you say. Right? Um, yeah, not be. quite a thousand, but mm. hundreds. All right. Yeah. Um I have an opinion that the biggest contributor to, to, and I'm just going to go out there and say it, passing, the biggest contributor to passing is believing you are a woman. It's, it's mm. that conviction that you go in someplace and you expect to be treated like a woman, not that you expect to be treated like a transgender person. But as a trans, as a woman, do you, what do you feel about that? Oh, well, this goes a couple of different ways because internally, if you believe that you are a woman and there is no doubt in your mind about it, that is going to have an effect on how you filter information that you see in your environment. Yes. Right. Right. And so all the information is always present. However, what we focus on and what we see shifts depending on what we believe. And the best example Agreed. that I've got of this is like when I was younger and I believed that everyone was looking at me and laughing at me because that was the experience that I had. Sure. I would walk around looking very sus. I would be looking at the ground. And I'd be like nervously looking up every now and then. Right. And that gives off certain cues. That has like an energetic effect on the people around us when they I see agree. us or perceive us. Yeah. And so it's the same thing with if you don't believe that you are a woman, you're going to have that same energy about you. And people might not even be able to pick up on it's that it's what you're thinking about. They might just go, oh, there's something a bit off about that person. Don't know exactly right. what it is. Right, right. And but then they might enough. find out the person's trans and go, Oh, oh, that must be what's off. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and that, that second thought that they have, though, it's enough to make them look a little closer or a little yeah, more closely. Absolutely. Sorry. So I should have used an adverb there as yeah. opposed to an adjective. But Well, you look you know, into something if there's something to look into. If someone yes. perceives that there's something to look into. Right, I, right. This is a horrible example, but <laughs> when I was younger, um, you know, my family wasn't the most upstanding of citizens. <laughs> they would teach me how to steal. Sure. Right? Like From you shopping do. Centers. Uh huh. <laughs> but one of the things that they spoke about, which is very interesting when it comes to this topic, is if you do not look like you are doing anything wrong, like no one is going to question you. Nobody thinks you are. Right. And like. <sighs> You know, that's early in my transition because I had no money and whatnot. I would steal makeup and stuff from shops. Certainly. Um, fairly right, often. Same. Yeah, of those course. Years. Yeah. But the thing that really stands out to me with that is if you're walking at a reasonable pace and, if, oh, my gosh, I'm giving people advice on how to steal. Don't take this as... <laughs> No, I'm not endorsing stealing. I, I, supp I suppose it's a good point. Although for what it's worth, I'm like, no, this was an amazing example because I think it's totally true. If you go in there and you go, look, I'm not at all suspicious. People aren't suspicious of you. No. 
to and Green what really Ruins. solidified that for me as a kid is like I was in a um, I was in a shop and I was playing around with um, one of the things from the shelf and my parents were like no we're not getting it we don't have the money whatever and I was still playing around with it and it was one of these um, metal pins where you press into it and you can put like a handprint in it and stuff oh yeah I, I put remember it on this. my head. Okay. I put it on my head and was like, oh, look, it fits there. And I forgot about it. <laughs> and on. so we walked out of the shop with this thing on my head. <laughs> I, I literally forgot about it. And my mum was like, what is, what's that on your head? And I take it off. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Let's and just go realized, home. <laughs> yeah, we did actually. Yeah. Good. But at that time, that's what really clicked to me. I was like, I didn't even know that I was accidentally taking that out of the shop. I didn't right. even know. And so I just would have came across as a regular kid doing regular things. Right. Right. It wouldn't have been suspicious at all. <laughs> but that's the thing. Not knowing that I had that thing on my head is almost the same as not knowing that there's anything about me that could clue on someone to think that I'm not a woman or whatever. If right. that's not even in my awareness, mm -hmm. then people are going to look at that just as they did at the kid. Oh, that's a kid being a kid. There's a woman being a woman. <laughs> right. Right. I'm glad we mm -hmm. had this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and again, not endorsing stealing. Oh my gosh. No, it's I was good, actually, um, I do, good example I do have to go shopping right after this. So actually it's a perfect <laughs> timing. Oh my gosh. No, oh, I, I, big A do I went crimes as they before. say. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. L luckily, I went shopping before before I I, I yeah. got on the uh, podcast, so that's good. Um, Excellent. We're almost out of time. Can uh, can you tell me how people can find you? Yes. So it's a bit difficult to find me now that I've changed from my stage name of Jasmine Lee to Jasmine Vine, because whenever people search Jasmine Vine, they get um, plants popping up. <laughs> yes. Do you know how um, often I've put that in and I go, Oh God damn it. I got to remember. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know. I know. But if you search Jasmine Vine trains on YouTube, it will come up. But anyway, that that's what you need. Yes. Right. <laughs> I, I have yes. had pl found plenty of information about horticulture, though, so that's it's been very valuable. I so I appreciate that. that. Thank you. You know, thanks. Learn something very well. So, how else do yes, people find Jasmine you? Jasmine Vine everywhere. So, Jasmine dot Vine E on Instagram is one of my main platforms. Same thing on TikTok, um, YouTube. Again, you might have to search trains with it on YouTube to find me. Right. <laughs> um. And then other than that, yeah, my website, javinecoaching.com is another place you can find me. Um, yeah, that's about it. All right. And I will have all of those in the show notes. Actually, I've got Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok that I've got right now. Excellent. So there you go. Cool. All right. Well, Jasmine, I definitely want to say thank you to you. And I certainly want to thank everybody who's been listening. I am Amethysta Herrick. You're listening to Gender Identity Weekly with Jasmine Vine, where we've talked about, gosh, all the things. Let's see, empowerment, um, how to be a regular kid doing regular things. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's an awesome conversation. Good. I hope so. I hope you weren't going, oh, boy, when does this end? <laughs> 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 no, not at all. No, but if you have more, if you have more tips and all for for um, you know, for the five finger discount, maybe start putting some of those on Instagram. Five finger discount. Yeah, it's when you pick something up and you steal it. That's the. Oh, I've not, <laughs> I've not heard of that. <laughs> I'm trying to remember where I got that. I don't even. It's like something you'd see in a 1930s movies or movie or something oh. where you know. Kids walking out of a drugstore or something, and the the police comes walking up with his his uh, what are those things? Mm. Billy Club? This the kind of says, "Hey, kid, what are you doing? You think you got a five finger discount or something? Give me the goods, something like that." That's which I sort of so I don't know where the hell that came from, but oh my goodness! But I oh, apologize. You're stealing a chocolate bar, I see. <laughs> Take that right. back to the shop. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
I'm heading back to I'm heading back to HQ, Chief. Do you need another chocolate bar? <laughs> I found another kid. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, perfect. I'm oh glad we gosh, we can do this stupid intro. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you know, I am likely not to edit this at all, because as soon as you get funny, jokey stuff, it's always at the end. And I hope oh, people yeah. kind of go, they, they go, oh, well, you know, there was like some some serious crap. And then, you know, and then they were going to go. And, and that's where the good show started. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what I hope. That's what turned into a comedy show. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And people, oh, you know, dear. they'd rather hear comedy than than otherwise. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Some people love dramas, and I just go, well, you know, oh, yeah. in, in moderation. Bloody episode on that. <laughs> right. So, all oh, right. Dear. I will actually shut it down. I even did, like, the good ending. And it wasn't a bad ending, because you had said, you know, if you just look like a regular kid doing regular yeah. kid things. I was like, wow, that was pretty good. I'm going to use that at the end. And now we've gone, like, two minutes past. So well done, us. Woo! <laughs> Oh All right, goodness. Jasmine. Thank Good you again. Chat. Thanks so much. Thank you. Talk soon.